How many people do you know who ate a whole food plant-based diet and ended up with a protein deficiency? How often have you heard of this happening? Well, I, you know, when it comes to protein, one of the things that a lot of people in the plant-based world say is, you know, if you're looking at protein deficiencies, the hospital wards would be empty. There aren't any. Um, and I think that's an overstatement, to be honest. Uh, so, so we don't see overt protein deficiency like we see in starving children in Africa where they would have kwashiorkor with the distended you know, stomachs and, and very emaciated limbs. We are a nation where we generally have an, a, an abundance of food. But it doesn't mean that people can't get enough protein. So we do see that. And, and let me just give you an example. Uh, so generally, people get enough protein from plant foods under a couple of conditions. One is that they're eating enough calories. So if you're eating enough calories, chances are you'll get enough protein if you're eating mostly whole foods. Uh, now what happens sometimes, and I've seen this on a number of occasions, is you'll see a teenager who gets excited about the environment, animal rights, and they don't have the knowledge about nutrition and they shift from eating a kind of a, you know, a fast food teenager diet with lots of soda pop and they were eating burgers and fries and chips and all of that. And all they do is remove the meat and remove the milk. So they're not eating ice cream and they're not drinking milk anymore and they're not uh, consuming burgers. Uh, so instead of the burger, they do a double order of fries and a pop. Uh, and they're having their granola bars and they're eating all their junk foods. And in fact, they may not get enough protein and they need a fair bit of protein as they're still growing. Uh, and then the other people we see sometimes not getting enough protein are, are people that are eating um, very high fruit diets uh, and not putting them together very well because fruit tends to have fairly low amounts of protein, they may not get enough either. Now we also see sometimes in seniors, seniors don't uh, digest and absorb amino acids as well as younger adults. And in fact, in some countries, for example in Australia, uh, people actually have a separate recommendation for people over 70. Uh, they need uh, about 25% more protein than a younger adult to meet their needs. And, and the reason is just because of the I I lower ability to break down and absorb the amino acids. And so it, it gets tricky because you've got an older, say an older gentleman who uh, may have needed 60 grams as an adult male. Now all of a sudden he needs 80 grams. But he's not eating 2,800 calories anymore because he doesn't move as quickly. He doesn't need as many calories. All of a sudden, he's only eating 2,000 calories. But he needs 20 grams more protein. And in these cases, we can actually see what we call sarcopenia or muscle wasting in older people that aren't getting enough protein. We also, I have also seen a number of people who are um, into raw food diets, but they're eating, you know, a diet that is fairly high in fat, lots of coconut products and so forth, where they may not be getting enough protein and they start to, um, they lose hair and, and, and uh, their, their skin becomes sort of almost uh, thin looking. Uh, they, they just, their bones start to, to get weaker. Uh, there are a number of things that happen because protein is a building block for the tissues that we build everything with, including our bones. And so they may not get enough protein. And, and so in, in all of these cases, the trick is not to all of a sudden start taking protein powders, but to recognize that in a whole food plant-based diet, you do want to be including legumes. You want to be including um, some of the higher protein choices in the various groups. So for example, things like hemp seeds or pumpkin seeds are very valuable. And, and so the point is most people eating a whole food plant-based diet do absolutely fine, but there are cases, and young children as well, 
where they need more p protein per pound of body weight. And so we need, because they consume smaller amounts of calories, we need to be a little more conscious of where their protein is coming from. And so really including the legumes and the seeds and some nuts and so forth in the diet. So not that it's difficult to do, but it's not impossible to not get enough protein. How do we get enough vitamins, minerals, and trace minerals? How do we prevent shortages of specific vitamins, minerals, healthy fats, and other essential nutrients? So, you know, the, the question of how do we get enough vitamins and minerals and essential fatty acids and all of these things, you know, I can remember 30 years ago when I started in this field and my, my, my goal was at that time um, to help people get this right. Because a failed vegan, especially a child, they don't get enough B12, they don't get enough iodine, they don't get enough calcium, whatever it is, sets us back 20 years. Because I'll tell you, it hits the headlines. Vegan child dies of B12 deficiency, or has irreversible brain damage, or whatever. And, and I've received calls from, you know, from lawyers who are representing vegan parents who are you know, going to go to jail because their child died of malnutrition. And my goal in life, <laughs> one of my, my major goals, especially early on in my career, was to create resources that would make this uh, almost impossible <laughs> for this to happen. I wanted to create guidelines that were pretty much foolproof. You couldn't blow it if you follow this guide. And that's why I've written so many books, like Becoming Vegan. Be, you know, we started with Becoming Vegetarian, and then Becoming Vegan, and then the new Becoming Vegetarian, and then Becoming Vegan Comprehensive and Express Editions, the, you know, completely rewritten uh, 10 years later, and so on and so on. And, and, and I think it's just so critical we get this right, because when we get it wrong, we become exhibit number one for why people are justified in eating meat. So we really need to take the time. Most of our nutrition education materials are geared towards omnivores. So as vegans or as plant-based eaters, even if you're not vegan, you need to take it upon yourself to get educated about how to do this correctly, especially if you're raising small children. And speaking of that, that's my next book. I, I just teamed with a, with a pediatrician from San Francisco. Her name is Rashma Shaw. And she is balanced, she is science-based, and she's a brilliant writer. And I'm really quite honored to be working with her, but to provide a resource for families. Uh, and so it, it, this is, um, you know, one of the things that my writing partner, Vasanto Molina, who I, I've done most of my books with, and I uh, have done, is to create these food guides. Like we have national food guides, so we've created vegan or plant-based food guides where we tell you how many servings of fruits and vegetables and, and legumes and nuts and seeds and greens and and, and then what are within each of these groups are your best calcium choices? How do you get enough calcium? And then there are some nutrients. Even if you do all that, you may not get enough of. And that those are uh, vitamin D, um, iodine, uh, essential fatty acids, and, and so how do and vitamin B12. And so how do we make sure that those are covered as well? And, and so just to you know summarize, eating the range of, of a variety of plant foods in the, in the reasonable amounts, um, getting a source of B12, which m the most reliable are supplements or B12 fortified foods. So like, like Red Star Nutritional Yeast or, or um, you know, fortified non-dairy beverages would be a reliable source. And, and then for, you know, for uh, iodine, um, people can uh, use uh, seaweed in, in varying amounts. They can use some iodized uh, salt, and I know people will cringe with that, but, but uh, certainly it's a reliable source, and you can get iodized salts that don't contain the, you know, all of the things that people are trying to avoid. You need to read the label. Um, 
and, uh, and you want to keep sodium low. So for me, I would prefer to rely on uh, a little sprinkle of kelp. All you need is about a sixteenth of a teaspoon or you know, a tenth of a teaspoon, depending. So it's a very small amount. You don't even taste it. You can sprinkle that. For people that love seaweeds, things like nori and dulse and, and wakame, those can be very reasonable choices as well. Now with iodine, the amounts we get vary depending on the, on, on the soil, the amount in the soil. In many places in Europe, like Italy and, and the UK and, and Finland, the amounts in the soil are very low. And so those people need to be really, really ultra vigilant because um, they're not going to be able to rely on fruits and vegetables and, and other plant foods much for their iodine. We can a little bit more in North America, but still the numbers, it, it, they, they're not concentrated sources. So, and then vitamin D, well of course sunshine is the ultimate source, but, um, but you know, uh, the sunshine is, I think, provides us with so much more than vitamin D. It's just so critical to our, our health. But many of us live in places where we don't have access to warm sunshine in the winter months. And we don't all have the money to be going to Hawaii every second month. Uh, so we need to rely on some supplements or fortified foods in that case as well. And then with essential fatty acids, again, uh, we have some, you know, some plant foods that really uh, offer more concentrated sources. And, and in you know, the omega-3 family, it's, it's seeds like chia and hemp and flax and, and, and then nuts like walnuts. And so just you know, learning specifically how to do this, you can put it together fairly easily.